everybody that's at Trello and Fog Creek. Like everyone said before, before we started, um, you know, small world, and it's good to see it come a little smaller. Um, so yeah, um, today I'm going to be talking about a side project that I'm working on called Descartes. Um, and again, that is after sort of the French philosopher. Um, and it's about writing CS in some JavaScript. Uh, but before I get into that, I'll say a little bit more about myself here. And let me see. Um, tell me if this is too small or hard to read. I can probably just resize the window to make the size a little bit bigger. Um, but um, there's two things that I do um, pretty much full time or um, partly. Um, here at Stack Overflow, my regular day job is um, as a developer here. I'm also known as a marketing engineering lead, and basically I run all the engineering support for the Stack Overflow brand and the marketing team. Um, basically, I think a lot about infrastructure, campaign production, and evangelism as well. Um, so I also run sort of the monthly tech talks that we have at Stack Overflow that we call Tiny Talks. Um, so it's also very welcome to see everyone and expand that family a bit more. Uh, besides that, I also work on a project called Bento, um, and this is just a passionate project where I help build tools for self-taught developers to find the best way to learn to code. Um, you might have heard about it before. It's on bento.io, and basically I curate the best learning tutorials from around the web. Um, so I think also a lot about how people learn, especially beginners. So jumping right in here, um, what's, what are we talking about today? Um, there's really four major parts to this talk. The first is sort of the motivation for what this project is. Like, what in the world is Descartes? And I'll tell you more, a little bit more about the, the inspiration for this experiment and also why I built this library. Um, the second is I'll go into actual features or like what is the actual uh, uh, usage of the, the, the project that I'm building. Um, three, which I think is what everyone's gonna be a little bit more interested in is just sort of how it works. Um, this is how I actually went about building the project, what are the approaches that I took, and some of the technical issues that I was running into. And then fourth is a very brief piece here, just what's next. Um, this is very much an experiment. Um, there's still a lot of things that I want to try out, and I'm very curious, of course, for your feedback at the very end here. So I'll tell you what it is that I'm thinking about, and I'd love to hear your thoughts. All right, so let's go into the motivation. And if you can't read the headline, it says, you've got to be joking, right? <laughs> so the way that I always talk about Descartes, whenever I, whenever I actually just mention this, this idea about writing a CSS in JavaScript, I always think about this one skit that Louis C.K. does called, of course, but maybe, and uh, I'm gonna see, I'm just gonna play this clip for you guys really quick. Um, can you all see this? We good? Anyone from audio queue? You can see it. All right, excellent, I'll play it right now. Everybody has a competition in their brain of good thoughts and bad thoughts. Hopefully they win, the good thoughts win. For me, I always have both. I have like the thing I believe, the good thing. That's the thing I believe. And then there's this thing. And I don't believe it, but it is there. It's always this thing and then this thing. It's become a category in my brain that I call, of course, but maybe. I'll give you an example. Okay, like, of course, of course, children who have nut allergies need to be protected. Of course, we have to segregate their food from nuts, have their medication available at all times, and anybody who manufactures or serves food needs to be aware of deadly nut allergies. Of course, but maybe, maybe if touching a nut kills you, you're supposed to die. Of course not. Of course not. Of course not. Jesus. I have a nephew who has that. I'd be devastated if something happened. But maybe, <laughs> maybe if we all just do this for one year, we're done with nut allergies forever. All right, so this is sort of the same feeling that I kind of have whenever I talk about writing CSS in JavaScript. Because the conversation always goes like, writing CSS with JavaScript is insane. Like, that's crazy, of course. Like, you should never, ever do that. You could, wouldn't do that in production. But maybe there's a few reasons that you might want to consider doing something like that. And you might have run into this, you know, across a few times, but 
this is generally the approach when I, that, that I'm sort of taking when I'm thinking about Descartes as a project as a whole. And I'll go into what those maybes might be and what those of courses might be. So the first of course portion of this is something that I call like, are you a wizard when it comes to the CSS stuff? Like, you know, of course you should always use CSS to do your styling whenever possible, right? Uh, if you wanted to do something, and this is my favorite example of this, if I wanted to simply vertically align something like a div, um, this is actually what you would do. Like this makes perfect sense. You would create a class, for example, called vertical align, and you could set position to be relative because who the hell knows why, and top 50% because also that makes sense, and then a transform of translate y minus negative 50%. And this is exactly what you would do. Like this is what you see in production. I do this in CSS when I'm actually writing projects. And this is what a lot of people would end up doing if they wanted to vertically align something like a div. But maybe that also makes no sense at all. Like why in the world does position relative in combination with a transform, in combination with something like a top 50% actually do anything? Like when you're actually looking at what a designer sometimes does or someone that is really fluent in CSS, it sometimes make it, makes it feel like you're invoking magical spells and incantations and recipes that don't necessarily make sense but for some reason work because of the way that CSS does. Those are just sort of written rules that actually do the thing that you want. They're sort of recipes and hacks, right? You know, if you really wanted to do something like make a div element vertically align, you might want to do something like, uh, you know, use the DOM and maybe do some basic math, right? So um, if you had something like a vertical align here where you can just set the margin top to be, well, take the parent element, take that height, take the current element's height, take the difference, divide that by two, and that's your margin top. For a programmer, that seems to make a lot more sense as opposed to why something that position relative works with the transform, works with X and Y. And this seems to make perfect sense because the math makes sense and you can actually calculate what that's going to be. But of course not. You know, DOM access and JavaScript and CSS is crazy. You would never actually see this in production if you wanted to do something this simple. Another one that I like to talk about is the cascade. Um, and this is probably something that a lot of you have thought about when you're writing CSS. It's like, how in the world is the cascade of work. And of course, you know, right now it's workable, right? The CSS, CSS and how the cascade works is workable. Um, you might be wondering, you know, why is everything global? You know, why does specificity denote priority? But generally, it's something that you can work with. If you wanted to write plain CSS or what your preprocessor might actually spit out, it might look something like this, where you're nesting elements inside of each, you're using those properties and, you know, making sure that the order there is right. And like I mentioned, you know, you can actually use less and SAS to make this a little bit easier, right? We have those things. And in addition to doing things like prioritization and nesting, it also gives you some things that kind of seem like variables, that also kind of seem like functions. Um, but, you know, that's generally what we do. You know, at Stack Overflow, we use um, both sometimes in, in, in certain um, parts. You know, mostly less, but we do use some SAS here and there. Um, and you'll see this in production environments everywhere else, where they use less and SAS a completely different environment to get you those things like variables, like mixins, and prioritization the way that you'd expect. Like, of course, this is what you would do. But maybe we kind of already have a lot of those things in JavaScript, if you really think about what that might look like. You know, what if you wanted to represent those nested pieces and style just like an object literal? You take a look at the example here, right? This is what lesser SAS would look like where you're nesting an element, or, you know, a selector, and then the actual properties and the rules there, and then you're nesting it again. You can actually represent that as, say, an object literal that looks very, very similar in the way that you want to nest, have key and value mappings, all that fun stuff. And if you were to use JavaScript, you would actually get variables. You would actually get functions. You get all the power of JavaScript in there. But of course not. That's not what you would do. This is not something that you would necessarily do in production. But with all those things together, there might be an idea here, right? So this is a thought experiment. What I'm doing here with Descartes is really a thought experiment to see, well, if we were to take all those ideas about CSS that we don't like and wondered if JavaScript could solve that, what would that look like? And you're actually starting to see some people sort of at the bleeding edges here doing some existing implementations. The most notable one here is probably what React is doing with inline styling. If you've ever used React before and you've sort of seen how they actually use components and actually use styling, how they work together, it's very similar. You're passing an object literal into React so that it can apply those styles. 
And there's also a lot of recent conversations about how the cascade works and also how uh, JavaScript and CSS are actually working together. And actually, one of my favorite talks, if you have the time, is by Fat, who is one of the co-creators of Bootstrap. He um, did a talk called The Cascading Shit Show, which is basically about the entire history of CSS and where things might be going and a lot of the problems that I'm talking about right now. So this is sort of the end result of what that initial sort of idea looks like, and that's what Descartes is. So it's, if you were to imagine if styling had full access to the DOM, full control over the cascade, and all the programming power of JavaScript without the need for lesser SAS, this is what it might look like, right? So if you take a look at what you know, the index.html is, the actual library itself was just like any other JavaScript library that you'd expect, right? Just in, um, put Descartes.js there, put it in the head. Um, there's a number of reasons why I'll go into why that's, that, that's the case. And then you can actually put your styles at the very end, just like any other JavaScript um, script that you may have. And then you can actually construct that entire, what I call a style tree, um, to pass into the Descartes library, and it'll apply a style just like the style sheet. But you get all the powerful functions that you'd expect out of JavaScript, like DOM access, like full control over the cascade, and all the things like variables, functions, et cetera, in there as well. So if you take a look at this, right, you can see something like a function where, you know, here it's producing a random angle. Um, this is actually is very similar to the code that's actually powering these slides right now. This slide is actually built in Descartes, and there's no actual CSS here other than the fonts. And what this does is actually is that every time I hit a key or change a slide, it changes the gradient background here. And this is actually using what Descartes um, is built for. And you can sort of see what's going on here. It's coming up with a random angle for that gradient using random angle. Uh, a random RGBA value, so it comes up with two random colors here for the um, beginning and the end. And what it does is it actually defines, okay, inside the HTML, inside of the body, what's the font family, what's the font size? Every time there's a key up, I want you to return a random gradient value with a random angle for the background. That's essentially what is happening here. Okay, so I'm gonna go into some of the features now and also sort of how that works to make you understand sort of what's going on here. But this is almost a hello world example of how Descartes works. So let's go into the features. What are the actual things that Descartes can do? So the first is just sort of the basic application here. And this is basically what you'd expect if you were to do something like turn your styles and lesson SAS into an object literal and pass it into a library. There is a method here called add, um, which basically lets you, uh, item potently sort of put in styles into the engine. So in this case, this is sort of a very basic example. You can just inline this where it looks very similar where you're nesting elements and the rules inside of each other. And it does a few really cool things like, you know, sensible pixel conversion. Um, if you're talking about the margin and the padding, it'll just add that PX in there. Um, it will also do things like uh, dash CSS properties. All you need to do is make sure that the property itself is quoted. Um, and of course, nesting that you'd expect in SAS and less. But where things get really cool here is actually in the construction of uh, you know, a, an actual style tree because what you can't do in Lesson SAS is sort of really break apart things unless you did them in a lot of different files. Because you're actually just passing in an object literal, you can actually construct that object literal however you'd like and then pass that into Descartes. So in this case, you can sort of have a base style here which is just an empty object and then you can individually define each element in there and their actual properties. So for HTML, the margin of the padding, the font family, the body itself. And then all you would do here is actually, you know, turn each of those properties and those rule sets as properties of the other rule sets that you have here. So you can actually construct those pieces too. And then you also would, of course, get the advantage of if you had those pieces somewhere else, say that, hey, you want to use somebody else's button that was well-defined in sort of a button variable. You can pull that in and just add that into any portion that you would like inside of your style tree. And then, of course, just add that into the method here and the engine. The next here is really about flexibility. So like I was saying before, well, now that you can sort of break apart that style tree and do modifications here, you can sort of take a look at what, well, what modifications and what flexibility you would get because you're doing this in JavaScript. So a very basic case of what it is that we're talking here is, you know, sometimes you have different styles for, you know, a paragraph tag, for example, depending on where something is nested.
Um, so for here, if you take a look at this style tree, you know, this is inside of the body. There's sort of a default paragraph style, which has a margin bottom of 15 and a font size of 18. But when it's nested inside of a section, say that you want the font size to be a little bit smaller to be 16. It's modified here. If you were to do this in less than SAS, you know, that's what you would have to do is sort of redefine it maybe a little bit or add in a function if you wanted to. But the really nice thing about this, if you're sort of breaking apart those styles, you could do the modification before you do the construction here. So in this case, you can define a body, define a section, define a paragraph style, and then as you're constructing it, modify what that font size would be before you pass it into the section. So you can essentially create templates of elements that you'd like and do modifications to it as you're constructing them. So the other really cool thing about this, of course, in addition to uh, you know, just adding in strings or whatever the sort of base CSS or less or SAS values that you can put in there, it gives you a lot of flexibility to come up with more complicated or sophisticated values for a lot of different CSS properties. You know, the most basic one here probably being something like an integer height or width. Um, this is an example about you know, maybe a class that lets you create a golden rectangle. If you're using a golden ratio, essentially, if you, the, the proportions there are um, by a multiple of phi, that's what a golden um, sort of rectangle would be here. So the height here would be 400, and the width would be 400 times 1 plus math square root of 5 divided by 2, which is essentially the definition of pi here um, for a usable one. Um, and it also does things like sensible pixel conversion like I've done before for things like font size, but for things that actually don't need that by default, like line height, it doesn't do that. But you can take that a step further, and instead of just thinking about sort of like, well, just simple evaluation inside of any of those values, you can actually start creating functions that will, one, either generate those values or create entire rule sets if you want us to. So in this case, instead of sort of um, hard coding in what that value of phi would be, you could essentially create a function that takes in what that, what that proportion might be and spits out the value as a result there. So you can create multiple kind of golden, uh, golden rectangles here by specifying a height and then an actual input there that will spit out that correct value. You can take that even a step further by not even just sort of specifying the value, but the entire rule set if you want it to, where you're actually returning an entire object that contains the rules as well as the values for that particular class, and then just apply it here if you'd like to. So there's a lot of flexibility that you can get with doing something like this in JavaScript. So the next thing that I want to talk about, and something that I alluded to earlier, um, was about DOM access. So that's the other really powerful thing about trying to think about CSS when in relation to the DOM. You might already do this for some more sophisticated UIs, things like parallax, for example. You already need to think about the DOM when you're trying to do some things like styling. Um, so you know, sufficiently sophisticated UIs start to think about, well, how do I, what does that mingle look like? But with here and with CSS, uh, or with, with, what, with what Descartes can do, you can actually get access to those things. So this would be something like a naive implementation of something like responsiveness, right? Um, you can create a wrapper, you know, if you want to center something with all the content, you don't want it to go to the entire width of your browser. Um, you can you know, set the margin so that it's centered, and then the width is dependent on what the window width would be. If the window width is greater than 800, make sure that the width goes no, longer than, uh, no wider than 800, otherwise make that 100%. Now, the thing about here is that this wouldn't necessarily work just yet, and I'll go into some of the other features that would make this work the way that you'd expect it to. Uh, the next thing here is really just thinking about functional values here. And this is where it's like, well, you don't need to just sort of pass in a string or an integer, right? You can actually also pass in things like, uh, you know, actual functions in here. So, ooh, let's see. So this is actually not there. Ah, there we go. Here we go. Um, in this case, you can actually pass in a function inside of as the value of a rule here. So if you're here for the vertical align, you know that example that I had from before where it's like, hey, what if you could just use the parent element and then the actual element itself and then do some math? This is essentially that implementation. Um, you can pass it in a function and then return what that value is going to be and Descartes will actually automatically sort of evaluate what that, what that calculation might be and return that value, set it, and put it inside of the DOM. Um, the other nice thing about this is that it'll also pass in the individual element that it is trying to uh, apply the style for as the first argument. So you can actually do element by element styling here as well, if you'd like to, for something more dynamic. Let's see, function values. Cool. All right, so how it works. Um, I'm going to go into a little bit of background here. Um, so when it comes to sort of how this was built, 
Um, there's uh, the first thing is that I built this mostly in ES 2015 or ES 6. I don't ever remember what the distinction is sometimes, but essentially this is also an experiment seeing how that would actually work. Um, there's some really nice features um, about ES 2015 that made uh, writing Descartes a lot easier. It's a lot of recursion. It's a really big class, for example, it makes things a lot easier here. Uh, the second is Sizzle. Um, Sizzle, for those of you that don't know what it is, it is essentially jQuery's selector engine. So you know when you do a dollar sign and then you pass in a string, how does it turn that string and actually return DOM elements? Um, that's actually something that's open source that the jQuery Foundation has actually allowed, and that's the one sort of external dependency that I have here inside of Descartes. The third thing I should say that this is really unstable. Um, this is not good for production <laughs> use. Don't do that yet. Uh, things change on basically a daily basis. Uh, so what we're having, what, what I'm showing here is basically a bleeding edge version of what Descartes is. Um, and the last thing that, you know, I would be remiss to, to not mention is that this is open source. So if you're starting to see things that um, are really interesting or you think that you might find a better way of doing this, please go ahead and take a look. Um, so the sample that I'm going to use here is very similar to that Hello World. And what I'm going to be doing is going to be showing you from the entry point all the way to um, the actual application of styles on the DOM and basically almost going like a debugger going to what the major steps are going to be. So if you take a look here, you can see what that, that script might look like. It starts with Descartes.add and then it just sort of takes in that style tree there with HTML, margin zero, padding zero, body, etc. So the first thing that I'll talk about is, so what is the general structure of how this works? How does it go from taking an object literal here all the way to um, CSS application and actually setting the style attribute here. Um, the first is really about construction. How do you actually take that object and sort of merge um, different pieces in there? Like if you wanted to use different style trees and then just add them constantly, how does that actually work? Um, how do you make sure that there are valid inputs? Uh, the second is something called, that I call flattening, which is how do you take that really deep tree or that, that really um, deep sort of style tree that you have there and turn that into something that JavaScript can understand and make it usable so that you can do all the really interesting things that you'd like um, for that. Um, third is painting. Um, this is essentially once you've actually done that flattening and something that, you know, turn the, the sort of data structure that you have for style tree into something that um, the DOM can understand, how do you actually turn that into styles themselves? And then the fourth is just sort of extras and exceptions here, some really cool things that I just want to mention here or there. So the first thing that I'm going to do is talk about add. And this is really the entry point here. This is the first place that you would actually put style trees inside of there. And remember what a style tree actually looks like. It just looks like lesser SAS represented as an object. And there's really two parts to this that are really important. The first is a merge, and then the second is a render. The merge is really essentially what you, is trying to mimic essentially what, uh, what happened if you had multiple style sheets, right? So say for example, you have a designer that has sort of a base style sheet here that they did as an object literal, and you have your own individual page styles that you wanna be able to put in there. How do you make sure that both of those things play well together? Essentially what that is going to be is what's called a merge. Um, Descartes always keeps um, a version of the current sort of styles uh, tree that it's working with, inside of the actual object in dot styles. And what that does is that every time you do add, it'll take as a uh, argument here, the one that you're trying to layer in there. And it'll try and do essentially a deep merge of both of those style trees together. Um, so that, you know, if you're doing something where you're nesting something maybe three levels down and it sees that it has the same keys in there, it'll also make sure that those properties um, also get merged in there as well. So it's not quite a shallow merge, it's a very deep merge so that you can get all the styles that you need in one tree into the existing tree. The second thing that it does is this thing called render. And render does really the heart of all of that work when it comes to the Descartes engine. Um, so if you can see, add is really just two methods here. It sets the, the internal styles tree um, to be a merge of what the tree that you're trying to pass in. And you can see that the, the target here, it really takes two arguments, the tree that you want to merge in, and then the target of the tree that you want to be able to merge into, and it defaults to the, the current style that the engine is aware of, right? And you can see that here, it's pretty much, it's a, it's a recursive and, and, and a deep merge here. You can see where the recursion here is, that like this is this dot merge, and you can see that happening inside of an object. And that's when you, know, you have nested elements, when you have functional values, when you have pieces like that. And then it just goes through each of those things, trying to infer and sort of sanitize that input before it's actually passed into the engine. Okay, Descartes.render is again sort of where the heart and where sort of the, the architecture of the rest of the engine comes in. 
Um, and at this point, this is really where the, those four pieces that I was talking about in the overview really happens. The next one is flatten. Um, the next thing that it does is sort of bind aliases. And this is also something that I got to talk about, but I will sort of mention briefly uh, later on, probably at the end if we have time. Um, and then eventually the cascading portion of this, how do we mimic cascading in CSS? Uh, paint, which is actually the taking those rules that you have in defined inside of JavaScript and actually applying those styles to individual elements on the DOM. And then finally, there's this thing called listeners that we'll probably talk a little bit about, but I won't get too deep into. So um, Descartes.flatten. So this is really taking that style tree that's pretty deep in there and turning that into something that the engine can actually use to start applying some of the really cool features that Descartes has in there. So if you take a look at the, uh, the style tree that I have here on the left where this looks very much like less in SAS, it's trying to turn this into what I call, you know, something like a flat object, which maps CSS selectors or element selectors here like HTML or HTML space body, HTML space body uh, space P. You know, these are the sort of the traditional CSS selectors that you would see not inside of lesser SAS, um, or even the ones that you would see you would pass into a jQuery library. And then it attaches all the metadata as well as the rules that are in there. And the, the metadata that's here is really sort of around priority. So this is sort of used as um, how to order uh, rule application in the cascade. An alias, which is something that I'll also talk about in terms of allowing access for event finding. Um, and then finally, of course, the actual rules there. So if you take a look here on the left and you're sort of like, okay, HTML, what's actually in there, there's really only two, two rules here, margin and padding zero. And you can see if you take a look at that selector, here are the rules, what is the pro priority in the cascade and does it have an alias if you need to mention it somewhere else. And it does the same thing where it does the nesting here for body and actually says, hey, body is actually a child of the HTML elements make sure that's the full string there, and then it does the rules there specific to that, that level in the actual style tree, et cetera, et cetera. As a result, what you get is this thing called a mapping, and that mapping really just maps, like I said before, uh, CSS selector or actual DOM selectors with all that metadata, especially the rules with their priority and the alias. And this is something that's kept inside of the engine that you can sort of refer to if you ever need to. Um, one of the things that happens right after the flatten is this thing called bind aliases. Now, one of the things I didn't really get to mention too much here was this idea of an alias here. If you really wanted to um, say that you have a function that's passed in as a value for something, um, what if you wanted to do event binding around that particular thing? Um, say, for example, you, you, know, you talk about a wrapper that has a width of 800 pixels. Um, but it depends on what the actual width of the window is going to be. What if you could actually bind firing that function to, this, to, to a window resize event? Um, you can actually get access to those things using what's called Descartes.alias. And you can sort of take a look what's happening here. Um, what, you would, what that actually ends up looking like is, let me see if we can actually get here and see what's going on. Let's see. Hmm. Well, actually, well, if you take a look at what this code does, you will see that it, what it does is it loops through each of those mappings and takes that selector. What it does from there is actually, hey, um, if you actually have a unique alias here, what you can do is go through each of the properties that you have, width, margin, um, padding bottom, et cetera, and you can essentially create something where it goes like, hey, Descartes.alias. The alias name dot width that gives you access to the function that you can fire. Um, as a callback to like Descartes, to like a window click or a window resize if you wanted to. So that way it gives you a lot of extensibility to go out there. Uh, the next thing that it does after trying to get, does that flatten and then does the cascade from there um, is figuring out based on the priority that we got from that flatten method, how do you actually mimic the cascade? So the, the interesting thing about trying to do, um, you know, uh, cascading with something like a JavaScript object is that there's no sense of sort of order inside of JavaScript properties, right? If you sort of have a basic key value mapping inside of JavaScript in a, in a JavaScript object, there's no sense in which, which one is first or which one's second or which one's third. In the same way that you might think about for the analog for less than SAS, there's an actual cascade that goes from top to bottom. So how do you actually specify what the priority would be there? And that's really specified by what the actual depth in that tree is, right? So if you have a P tag that's nested inside of three DOM elements, that has higher priority than one that's all the way up inside of the body if you didn't nest that at all. And this is all that that's doing is turning that 
really large mapping object into an ordered list of rules to start applying into the DOM. So it mimics the cascade that you would see inside of CSS. So the next thing that actually happens here is that you actually take all of those ordered rules that you have that are ordered by priority, and then you start doing this thing where you start applying a rule set. And if you take a look at the code here, it's doing something really interesting. Um, if you, it, what it takes in is a selector, right? Sort of the key of that, of that mappings object that we have that is like HTML body or HTML body P. It maps to a particular selector that you have there. And then it also takes in a rule set, like margin zero, padding zero, font size of 16, font family, Arial. And then what it does is that it tries to construct um, basically a JSON object that it keeps inside of that element. So if you take a look here, okay, just doing some basic checking here, just to make sure that there are elements that exist, that there isn't a null rule set or selector. And then it goes through each of the elements that exists there and actually tries to get what's called a data Descartes attribute and then sort of layer in each of those rules. The result of that, if you take a look at what the, uh, what the HTML sort of looks like when you're inspecting and debugging, this is sort of in debug mode, you'll see that there's a data Descartes attribute inside each of these elements that is sort of taking each of those rules according to priority and creating a JSON string that actually represents all the rules that you want to apply to that particular element. And that's what apply rule set does. Apply rule set also calls this function called compute rule. And this is where a lot of that really cool stuff with sort of functions being firing and evaluating before those turning into variables and also doing things like pixel inference. So if you take a look here, hey, if the value of that property is a function, just evaluate that actual function, return that as the value. Um, take a look at any of the properties that it's trying to see and see if there's a reasonable pixel conversion here. And of course, escape any strings. If you just put in a straight string of Arial for a font family, you also need to put things like single quotes around it and then pass that in. And then finally, what you end up doing there is like, okay, well now that you have all those data Descartes attributes all over the place with the HTML, just take that, parse that as JSON, and then create a style string, right? You now have a key value mapping of like, hey, what's the CSS property? What's the value? And that's what this looks like. Um, if you were to sort of take a look at that, it just takes the rule set, what the element is supposed to be, and then it just sort of does a regular sort of property that it, the construction of a string as you'd expect if you were to take that from, a, uh, from an actual uh, JavaScript object. What's um, really cool about some of these things is that there's a few pieces that I, I should probably mention when it comes to how that finally works in the, uh, from a high level. The first is sort of just DOM hiding. Um, you can imagine what might happen here um, is that, well, because this is all happening in JavaScript, there might be like a flashing moment, right, where there are no styles that are attached at all and then stuff that suddenly just gets attached all at once. And you might see a little bit of a delay there. What I'm actually doing is that I'm actually hiding the DOM before any of that actually happens, so it doesn't look like there's an unstyled version and then a styled version. That causes a bit of a performance hit, and I'm always looking for more ideas about how that might work. And one of those things that I'm thinking about is generating a style sheet. Um, so you know I just talked about create style string before. You can actually use that style tree to create an actual CSS file if you really wanted to. You can essentially create the typical CSS mappings that you would typically see out of a preprocessor by using create style string and generating a CSS style sheet as a backup so you don't ever actually have to do DOM hiding if you don't want to. Now, the third thing is just sort of compatibility here. Because the scope of what Descartes is doing is really about styling, it doesn't try to do too much when it comes to things like, oh, like event binding or anything like that. It works really well with things like React, works really well with jQuery. Um, you can see that happening. Um, if you just sort of take a look at the inner workings of how Descartes works. And the fourth is extensibility here. Um, we can see a lot of really interesting entry points in some of these methods where you can do some interesting things like uh, CSS prefixes, right? Um, if you were to do something like, oh, well, when I'm taking a tree, let's process that through a function that adds CSS prefixes to those things that might need them and then pass it into the engine. You can see that there's quite a bit of extensibility here as well. So what's next? What are the things that I'm thinking about? Um, the number one thing that I'm thinking about is performance. That's the first thing. Um, you know, because this is written in JavaScript and this is not what JavaScript is necessarily um, meant to be doing, how do we make sure that, you know, if anyone were ever going to be actually using this, that the performance is there? Um, it can get pretty fast, but there are certain things that you can do, like um, thinking about using workers um, or having CSS backups or anything like hardware acceleration that you might be able, that you, uh, might be hearing about here and then when it comes to JavaScript, 
and see how that might actually improve the performance of Descartes so it could be used in a production environment. Uh, the second is the ecosystem. Um, because there is sort of a lot of, uh, I think it opens the door for some extensibility here, could, you do, could this be an ecosystem, right? Could it really open up the door for people to really think about, hey, this is how you would do buttons. This is how you would do the overall structure of your CSS and have it inside of, being, inside of JavaScript and take some of the ideas that we see in the JavaScript ecosystem and really apply them to CSS and styling here. Um, the third is around event binding. Um, there's always a sort of a gray line here um, or, uh, yeah, there, there's sort of a really gray area here about where, C where CSS has and where JavaScript has, and this is really treading that line. Event binding is sort of right in that space and trying to figure out where that's going to go. It's a little bit hard. And the fourth is just cascading. Um, you know, I'm still borrowing a lot of ideas from CSS cascading, um, and I don't think that it's perfect here. Um, it's still relying a lot on traditional ideas around nesting and priority. Um, to do cascading, but is there a better way of doing that? And that's it. Um, so I'm still experimenting. I'm always looking for feedback, even really crazy ideas, because this is a really crazy idea. Um, if any of you have you know, any interest in taking a look at the source code, maybe in contributing, it's on GitHub. Um, and yeah, if you want to continue the conversation, I'm always happy to chat with you on Twitter. Um, any questions? First of all, thanks very much, John. I'll give you a quick clap, those to lay out some cheers.